Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, Father. We thank you that in spite of all the of all the uh, error and all of the silliness that that uh, that the world puts into uh, puts into the remembrances of your greatness and glory, despite all the the uh, obstructions and distractions, Lord. You uh, you have given us Your Spirit to dwell in us, Your Word to teach and to guide us, that both of which never change, never get adulterated, Father, but Lord, You've given us pure truth that we might just be grateful and glorify You for all that You have done in truth. And all the noise of the world out there just fades into the background, Father, as we focus on You looking unto Jesus. And Father, we pray that as we do that through the service today, You would be here by Your grace in our hearts. Teach us and build us up by Your Word, Father, was our prayer. In our Savior's name, Amen. First Peter and chapter five, coming into the last chapter in our study of First Peter, and let's read oh the first five verses or so. First Peter chapter five. Peter writes, "The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder." and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. All right. So as uh, as Peter moves on now here in chapter five we're moving into a uh, some instruction on the the orderly function of the church. Peter's been talking about uh, the exercise of of gifts and he and he he touches on that briefly and now he's going to begin to talk to uh, who he calls elders and their attitude toward the people, and then the people and their attitude uh, back again, and then our attitude toward each other. Basically what he's doing is what Paul says when Paul talks about knowing how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God. And Peter brings out the, uh, the nature of the order of the local assembly uh, for his folks, and he says, he says, the elders which are among you. Now, you remember, Peter is writing to uh, saints that are scattered in different areas, in different churches. So this is a uh, this is not an epistle that's addressed to any one local assembly. So he says to all of the elders that are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So, Peter is going to begin this exhortation to elders in the church by setting himself as an example. He says, I'm speaking to you elders as an elder myself. And what Peter is doing here is he's putting himself in in the position that he's about to call these other elders too, and that is being an example. He says you're not lords over the flock, but you're, you act as examples to them. The difference is that one uh, whips from behind and the other leads from in front, right? 
So that's what Peter's doing here. First thing he says is, I'm an elder myself. And, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now Peter here, he's speaking. It's interesting that he's talking to elders. He's been talking about suffering. This entire epistle, we've seen that. And when he talks to elders here, he specifically says that he is a witness, an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ, of what Christ went through. And he he kind of uh, gives a gives that picture of the suffering of Christ to these elders of the church. And the idea there uh, is that these guys are going to suffer. Peter's been calling all these saints to suffer uh, joyfully, to suffer willingly, and, and all these things. And the elders in the church, are he expects, are going to suffer most of all. They, they are uh, examples in many things, including that suffering that Peter has been calling these saints to. So he says, I'm an eyewitness of the sufferings, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So here again now, Peter is doing what he has been doing through this epistle. Uh, For these elders, he's telling them about the sufferings. Basically, I saw Christ go through what he went through, and by extension, you guys are are going to be doing the same. But then he reminds them of that glory to follow, which is the uh, the motivation to endure the suffering. Now, that I want to point something out to you here as we as we come out now to the end of this epistle, because Peter is he, he's not so much talking about the saints suffering anymore. He's going to go on to, to some different things in the rest of this epistle. But the suffering has been a primary theme here. And here he says, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, does that remind you of anything? If you come back to chapter 1, where he started out, 1 Peter chapter 1, when he says, he talks about uh, verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So here in chapter 1 he says that the Old uh, Testament prophets talked about some things and they talked about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In chapter 5, He says, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So this is the focus. Now, if if you hear, he says there, I'm a witness. Turn to 2 Peter in chapter 1. It's interesting, 1 Peter has been about the sufferings of Christ and how that relates to the saints that Peter's writing to. Second Peter is about the glory that shall follow. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16 For we have not followed cunning, cunningly devised fable, fables <clears throat> when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So in 1 Peter, he says, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. 
In 2 Peter, he says, I'm an eyewitness of the coming of Christ, of his majesty. And he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration and what happened there. And if you read 2 Peter, the, the second coming and the glory is as much a theme, the theme of 2 Peter as the suffering is of 1 Peter. Now, come, come back with me to the book of Acts and chapter 1. And I just want to notice a comparison and a contrast here. <clears throat> These apostles, they were called by the Lord to be witnesses. So that's what Peter says he is more than once. I'm a witness. I'm an eyewitness. Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, before, this is the Lord now speaking to the twelve before he ascends. But you shall receive power, Acts 1.8, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So these guys are called to be witnesses. They were there, in fact, when... Uh, as this chapter goes on, Peter starts talking about Judas, who isn't among them anymore, and now needs to be replaced. And who does he have to be replaced with? Verse 21, chapter 1. Wherefore, of these men, which have companied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So Peter says that the guy who replaces Judas as one of the twelve has got to be a witness, and a witness who's been there since the beginning, from the baptism of John all the way to the day that the Lord ascended up. But you notice here what he's going to be a witness of. He says to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now Peter, that the, the ministry of the twelve starts out that way. They, they don't act as witnesses to the sufferings of Christ because the people that they're writing to were also, that they're speaking to in, the, in early Acts, were also eyewitnesses of his suffering. In fact, they're the ones who killed him. So Peter doesn't need to... What, what Peter and the others are is they're eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Look over in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So that's their, their position as witnesses, is to be witnesses of the resurrection. Now by the time you get, that's early on in the book of Acts, in the apostles' ministry. Now as that... Uh, as events unfold through the book of Acts and through the history of these people's ministry, the, the people that they're witnessing the resurrection to are rejecting. And the people who, uh, the people who accept are those people who come from all of these scattered places that they talk to back in 
back in chapter 2 and and a lot of them got saved and they went back out and those are the people Peter is writing to in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter so the witness to the resurrection Peter mentions the resurrection more than once in his epistles but that's not the focus the focus is the sufferings and the glory that shall follow so that's what Peter serves as a witness of by the time he's writing to the saints the people who needed the witness of the resurrection the people who saw who were eyewitnesses themselves of the suffering rejected Christ so when Peter talks to these people who he's writing to they didn't witness the sufferings all they know is they came along and uh, and the Holy Ghost was on these people and they were all speaking in tongues and filled with joy and everybody was sharing everything and life was wonderful. It was a great... They didn't see the suffering. Peter says, I saw the suffering. And that's what he bears witness to, uh, to the saints. The resurrection is... Uh, he's, they're witnesses to unbelievers of the resurrection. To the believers, he's, uh, it's all about the suffering for Peter and the glory that shall follow. So, back in, in 1 Peter, does that mean that they're not going to be in the resurrection? No, of course they will. And again, Peter doesn't neglect to mention it. But it's not a primary uh, theme of his preaching. The theme of his preaching is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. First Peter chapter 5. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So the Lord, we know that the Lord said, as a matter of fact, he, when he laid down the same criteria that we just saw Peter lay down, those of you who have followed me from the beginning, when the Son of Man shall sit on his throne in Jerusalem, you shall sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's why Judas had to be replaced. Because there's twelve thrones there and one of them's not going to be empty. So Matthias is going to be sitting in that, uh, in that seat. So Peter says here, I'm a partaker of that glory that's going to be revealed. And you notice, he puts that in the, in the present tense. The glory is future. The glory shall be revealed. But he says that I am a partaker of it. And Peter, he's already in that glory as far as he's concerned. And that's exactly what he's calling these folks to. And it's what Paul calls you and me to. To live today in that future glory as if we were already there. Because as far as God is concerned, we are. So Peter doesn't say, I'm going to partake of it. He says, I am a partaker of that glory that's going to be revealed. In other words, I've already got it. You don't see it yet. It's going to be revealed. But it's my possession now. I have it now. Same is true for you and for me. So, he says to the elders, and of course, the, and, and he's speaking specifically to elders in the church, of which all those things are also true. Feed the flock, and of the people as well, obviously. <laughs> Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, and not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So the first calling of the elder, the pastor, the bishop, whatever you'd like to call it, Peter uses the term bishop, uh, with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ here in this epistle, and he calls him the, the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So the Lord Jesus Christ is what Peter is about to call the chief shepherd. So he's writing to elders. Well, 
a shepherd is a, is a pastor, is a bishop. All those words mean the same thing. To, uh, and the first responsibility, the first calling, the first um, job duty of an elder in a church is to feed. To feed the flock of God which is among you. So the job of the elder primarily is to teach and to preach the word of God. The, the elder in the church is not, uh, is not first and foremost an administrator. The elder of the church, an elder of the church, is not first and foremost a, uh, a counselor. He is all those things, but he is first and foremost a teacher. A teacher of the word. That's to feed the flock of God. And and Paul, you know, we talk about us not being uh, not being sheep. All the sheep references in the in the uh, New Testament are talking about Israel. But Paul tells the Ephesian elders to feed the flock at that church at Ephesus, that body church. Same thing Peter is saying here: to feed the flock of God, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So it is the uh, the calling and the duty, first and foremost, of every elder to feed. And of course, we feed with the Word of God, to teach it, to preach it. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. It is the duty of the elder to take the oversight of the flock. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's, what that means in its in its most basic form is that it's the pastor's business to get up in our business. What does oversight mean? It means to look over. What does that mean? It means that he knows what's going on in my life, and he's not being uh, he's not being nosy, and he's not sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. He's taking oversight. That's what Peter is calling these guys to do, to, uh, to be concerned with people's lives other than your own, the people that God has, has put you together with. Feed the flock to shepherd that flock. Thank you. Feed the flock which is among you. See, the people that, uh, that God has given to be with you, Feed them and take oversight. So we're talking about church government here and the roles of of, uh, of different people and, and positions in the church. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. So Peter says here, come on, come on back with me. To First Timothy, Peter says, "You're to do this, and not by constraint, but willingly." First Peter, First uh, Timothy, chapter three. You know, you say, "Why would anybody take on a pastor by constraint? How would that? How are you going to force somebody to to be a pastor?" Well. Let me ask you something. Do you go to your job by constraint or do you do it willingly? Uh huh. If you didn't have to, would you? <laughs> See, that's the difference between doing something by constraint and doing it willingly. It, it, do you do it because you got to do it? Or do you do it because this is what you want to do? Now, that's, that's why. You know, the, the, the idea, you know, there's a lot of folks, now this, this generally tends to shake out okay, but there, there's a lot of Christian folks who, uh, who believe that people are called to the ministry whether they like it or not. And, uh, and that's just not what the Bible teaches, okay? For at least not, um, not today in this age, 
Now in the early church, the Holy Spirit distributed gifts severally as he will. And it was according to the, to the Holy Ghost and he gave certain gifts to certain people according to his own choice. Paul says, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I got it whether I want it or not, so I may as well do it willingly. But here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So what's the first question to ask? Should I be in the ministry or shouldn't I? Well, do you desire the office? I don't know if the Lord's calling me or not. Well, do you desire the office? Not, not by constraint, but willingly. That's the first question that a man needs to, needs to ask himself. If you don't desire the office, then, then don't do it. The Lord doesn't want you there any more than you want to be there. If you do, then you're called. Because the Lord calls us all to, uh, to serve Him in whatever capacity that, that, uh, that He gives us opportunity to do. So, after that, then you need to go down through this passage and start looking at the criteria and go, okay, if I'm going to do this, here's this has got to be me. And if it wasn't me yesterday, it needs to be me going forward. So, if a man desire the office, that's the criteria there, First Peter 5 again. So not by constraint, but willingly. And again, that idea of the ministry and the pastorate in particular, becoming a job. You know, you can't hardly help that from happening. When you do something every day, no matter how much you love it, if you, whatever interest you have in life, you start doing that thing professionally to, is to support yourself and your family, and eventually it becomes a job. No matter how much you love it, it's, uh, you, you've, you've kind of, you know, you're into you're into photography, and people, you, you know, you love to go out and take pictures and do all all this stuff, and then then all of a sudden you go, you know, I should do this for a living, and you start doing that for a living, and all of a sudden you realize that this has become a drudgery here. I got appointments to keep, I got books to keep, I got all this administrative stuff to do. I got to be here on a certain day on a certain time, and I don't feel like being there, and and all of that. So in in the pastorate. Can, can become like that too. And then a lot of folks choose the pastorate as it, they put it in with their career choices. I can be a, you know, a butcher, baker, or a, or a preacher. Which one, you know, which one do I want to be? And they do that, and they'll go to seminary and uh, and and get a degree because they've chosen the career of uh, of of being a pastor. So you so in that case, you've made it a job to start with from day one. You've just chosen it as a job, Peter. All of, all of those things are involved here with this idea of not by constraint but willingly. You say, well, what happens? If I started out willing, and now it's become a job. Well, now it becomes a frame of mind, doesn't it? Now, it again, like Paul, Paul says, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I still got to do it. And his conclusion there is, therefore, I'm doing it willingly. I choose to do it willingly. And that's... Uh, you know, that'll help in, in just about any career choice that you make, too. you got to do it, so you may as well do it willingly, right? But for the ministry, it's that uh, God loveth a cheerful giver principle. 
We give not by constraint, but we do it willingly and cheerfully. It's the same thing with the ministry. So, back in 1 Peter 5, Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So here's that idea now for filthy lucre. We know what that is when something's lucrative. It means you make a lot of money doing it. And when you got filthy lucre, it means you made the money dishonestly, right? Doesn't mean just because a pastor gets paid, doesn't mean he's doing it for filthy lucre. Filthy lucre is a, is a special kind of lucre, right? And how do you do this for filthy lucre? Well, come back to Titus. The pastor was just teaching us about this. Titus chapter 1. Paul tells Titus, talking about some things in the same context, that is the orderly function of the church. Titus chapter 1 verse 5, For this cause... Left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So that's what we're talking about, elders. And he goes on and gives the uh, the criteria in verse, uh, pick it up, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. So how do you get filthy lucre out of the ministry? Well, you do it by teaching things that you ought not. You do it you do it by compromising the truth. Because listen, <coughs> very few people ever get rich teaching and preaching the truth. Okay? Very few churches, not none, but very few, ever grow to uh, enormous size preaching the truth. The truth of God is like a is like a giant funnel. <laughs> and it starts with this with this wide kind of net. Believe in Jesus. A lot of people believe in Jesus. Then you start getting more and more truth and it starts funneling down and you start getting less and less people who want anything to do with it. And by the time you get to some good, solid uh, body of doctrine that you can live by, you're in a pretty narrow uh, mouth of that, of that funnel there. And, uh, and you've weeded out a whole lot of people, and when you weed out a whole lot of people, you weed out the money that comes along with it. I remember when we had the church on Kedzie Avenue there on the south side of Chicago, a guy got in touch with us from the neighborhood, and he said that he uh, he specialized in in converting people. I said, "Wow, <laughs> praise God." <laughs> That's a great thing to specialize in. (laughs) And he wanted to partner with us. And uh, and he was going to fill our church. He said, I know what you want. You want to to fill that little storefront up that you got. And you want to get out of there. And you want to get into a real church building. And I can do that for you. (laughs) And I said, well, that would be great. Uh, You know, what... uh, Tell me about this, um, you know, this conversion method that that you that you have that that seems to work so well. And he said he had this like eight step thing that he had a system that uh, that he said it was it's 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 guaranteed to uh, bring. And he gave me some kind of crazy percentage to lead people, you know. Basically, from the street to the seat. That was his. That was his thing. Get him from the street to the seat. And and 
you know, he said, because, you know, I know that's what you want. And I said, well, no, that's, that's not what we want. That is not what we want at all. We don't want, we're not, we're not here to put, excuse me, butts in the seats. We're here because we, we want to be a part of a church that teaches and preaches the truth. That's what we want. That's why we're here. And an eight-step a uh, system of of conversion i don't see that in the bible anywhere i don't see that in the bible anywhere and that sounds very different than what paul calls the simplicity that is in christ jesus and you're taking this thing and you're making it uh you're see that that whole thing for filthy lucre i know what you want you want to fill up your church. Well, in other words, what you want is you want to fill up your coffers. I know what you want. It was it was like it was. It, it, as far as I could tell, the man was a brother. But it was like the devil himself was. I know what you want. You want to you want to fill up those your bank account, don't you? I can do that for you. He wasn't even asking for anything. He just wanted to come in and, and uh, you know, put butts in our seats, I guess. I think you can, you can keep the butts to yourself. We want Christians is what we're looking for. Not looking for a bunch, of, a bunch of people who are converted by a system so that the next time the next system comes along, they can be reconverted over to that. We're looking for something real. So... Peter says, don't do what you're doing for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Ready for what? Ready to be poor. <laughs> ready not to have filthy lucre. Ready to, uh, to be a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. All of those, uh, all of those things that you're going to have to do if you're going to be feeding the flock, taking the oversight thereof willingly, and uh, and not doing it for money, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So now, here, come back over to Matthew 23 with me. Because Peter's telling them the same thing that the Lord told him and told them all. Matthew 23. It is not for the elder to be a dictator. And you notice that it is a plural that Peter is uh, addressing here. The elders that are among you. Matthew 23. There is not one person who is in charge of all of these different churches. You know, you learn a lot about the government of the local church and of the church as a whole if you just pay attention to the, to the kind of um, understood uh, side statements. You know, it's never, it, it's, it's never said... Don't have a mother church with a bunch of you know churches in subjection under underneath it. It's just assumed through the Bible that each local assembly is individually, independently governed and run, and there is no lord over the uh, the assembly of churches. There is no hierarchy from without. The only hierarchy, if there is one, is confined to the local assembly itself. And there is an order there that needs to be followed, but that order is uh, comes from within the local assembly. And by the way, these elders, they ought to come from inside the assembly too. And, uh, you know, that's not always possible, but it is by far uh, preferred. To not have to go out into to someplace else and to candidate people to come in and, and be your pastor when one pastor leaves 
and you got to pick up another one from some somebody you you don't know or you barely know, and uh, it, it's far better if you're feeding the flock, taking the oversight thereof. If you've got people in uh, in your assembly, as our pastor does here, as we do here, who can uh, who can stand in and uh, and take over take over the oversight and the feeding when when the time comes that's how it ought to work if at all possible Matthew chapter 23 boy where do we want to start this um Verse, all right, start in the beginning. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So that's their elders. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say, and do not. So Peter tells his folks, his elders, don't be lords over God's heritage. Interesting term. God's heritage. He's talking about Israel. But be in samples to the flock. So Jesus here has to say, you see your elders over here? Do what they say, but don't do what they do. Because they're not being the examples that they were supposed to be. For they say and they do not. For they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on, main, on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You know what that's called? That's called lording it over your people. Getting your people to do all the work that you're not willing to do yourself. And that's, you know, that's... That's what a Lord does. Sit back and, and let your servants do all, the, do all the work for you. Peter says you don't want to be that. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. So the stuff they do do, they're doing for the wrong reason. They make broad their phylacteries, enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and chief seats in the synagogues, greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They love that title. But be not ye called, Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye all are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. So that's what Peter's calling his elders to. Not to be lords over God's people, but to be examples. That means you are their servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So that's what the Lord called these these guys to. That's what they're providing the example of. Peter himself, <coughs> Paul as well, and all of the apostles. And that's what he calls the elders to. To be the servants of your people. Not the Lord's. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So there's that, that glory to come. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter reminds them here, is the chief shepherd. The Lord calls himself the Good Shepherd. He says the Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. A hireling doesn't give his life for the sheep. A hireling sees the, the wolf coming, the robber's coming, and he hightails it off the other way because he doesn't care about the sheep. He, it's a job to him. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
The good shepherd gets in front and gets in between his sheep and that wolf. So when the chief shepherd, so the chief shepherd now means that elder, there's somebody over you. And you are under authority. And that's what Peter is saying here. You are not the chief shepherd. I don't care if they call you the head pastor or if they call you the, uh, the, 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 the pontiff or the potentate or, or whatever title men give you. You're not the chief shepherd. Kiss your ring. The chief, yeah. <laughs> the chief shepherd is, uh, is going to come one day. And you don't want to be found having uh, tried to usurp his position. When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that um, all of that stuff in those first uh, three verses there, two or in verse 2 and 3 anyway, all that stuff is, is a form of suffering for the elder, just like any service that we do, any ministry that we do, is a form of suffering. You do things for other people instead of for yourself, that's a form of suffering. So Peter calls them to all of that suffering and to do it willingly and reminds them of that glory that is to come. So there again you have that same recurring, repeating theme here. The sufferings of Christ, the glory that shall follow. And we will leave it there. We were going to get further today, but time went faster than it usually does. I think that clock might be moving. Might be moving fast. Do you have a question or a comment, Benny? Um, when Paul was en route to Damascus, mm-hmm. um, he met the Lord, right? He met? He met the Lord. Right. In a serious manner. Because that was his conversion. Right. Now, to me, he, he seems like he wasn't looking for that. You know, like, here, here's my point. A lot of people get saved or want to be saved for different reasons. I don't want to burn. Right. I, seven, I don't need to burn. I, yeah. I can't deal with the heat. Yeah. And, and, and that's my true motivation. That's why I got saved. Yeah. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> right. Period. Right. Okay. But Paul wasn't asking for that. Yeah. It seems as though the Lord just boom and gave it to him. Yeah. But yet and still he suffered more than any human being that I've ever read about. Yeah. And went through all those things and he began to love it. But when when was that transformation done? It, it seems I, I can't seem to find that in the scripture. Yeah, well as as he as he grew. He himself says in the same passage where he says that what you're talking about, which is that I was apprehended. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't running toward the Lord. He grabbed a hold of me uh, as I was running away. Uh, in that same passage, he says uh, he, his goal in life is to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. And, uh, and he... He understood the first thing the Lord said about him when he when he came to Ananias said there's a blind guy over here called Saul I need you to go and baptize him and and tell him I'm calling the first thing he says about him is to tell him how much how many things he must suffer for my sake that's the first thing the Lord said about about Paul so yeah and uh, and it was it was Paul's goal in life. To, as he again says, fill up that which is behind of the sufferings of Christ in his flesh. That as much as he suffered, and you're right, he suffered more than most. Uh, he says, I've still got catching up to do. I've still got something's behind of the sufferings of Christ that I still need to fulfill in my body. Am I wrong? Because what I understand him to say, he enjoyed suffering. Yeah. It, it, he he was able to have joy in suffering. In suffering, he said, "Yeah, he wasn't." Paul was not a uh, he was not a masochist. He was when um, who was it? Felix. Felix. Yeah, I think it was Felix. Anyway, as Paul is standing there chained in front of in front of one of the 
one of the governors, he's, uh, oh no, it was, uh, uh, was it Agrippa? Who, who said, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian? And Paul's answer was, I would that everyone were like me, except for these chains. I'm, I'm not crazy about the chains. Other than, other than the chains, uh, you know, everything's, everything's good. So it's, it's not that he enjoyed the suffering, but he was able to have joy in it. Yeah. He took it without a complaint. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Bill. We went and saw that movie, Paul the Apostle. Oh, yeah. How was that, Paul the Apostle? You know, it was the last days of his life while he was in prison before they beheaded him. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mark, um, Luke, was, Luke was ministering to him. And uh, I'll tell you something. It brought tears to your eyes, buddy. It was that good. Yeah. Movie. Was it? So was the whole movie just about his last days, or did it follow him through? They were off on some things like, I wish they would have put in there that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah, they right. Really they didn't touch on that. No, yeah. It was more of a Jewish flair to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, kind of a, just an autobiography of a man's life it's kind weird. of a thing. They yeah. had back, they had back flashes. You know, they... They had his road to Damascus experience. Oh, okay, I see. I see. So they started at the end and then flashed to the throughout the story. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. And he was in the dungeon. He was he was beaten. He was tortured. He was whipped. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you spoiled the whole thing. <laughs> I saved you. I saved you a hundred dollars. Save me the money for. <laughs> I, I don't mean to minimize the love of Christ. The love of Christ is super important in, in my opinion. But that escape in hell right now, sort of on the scale. The I didn't hear what you said. Loving the Lord because He first loved me. Mm-hmm. That's important to me. Yeah. But on the scale where I am now, that missing hell is sort of out. Yeah, no, I I get you. I mean, there's uh, the one thing about salvation is that is that you're saved from, uh, and what are you saved from? Well, you're saved from hell. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be ashamed of having that as my uh, as my motivation and a primary joy of uh, of my salvation is the fact that that I ain't going to have to go through what I was saved from. Yeah, amen. And that's uh, and that's what motivates. Uh, that's what motivates most people to get saved, is uh, is is not wanting to go through the alternative. It's when you can be when you can see the alternative, you you look for you look for the for the solution. Yeah, what you got out. When when God begins to move in your life and you're unsaved, you know, there's there's not a joy. There's no happiness there. It's it's complete grief. You know, I mean, because and you're looking at you're looking at your inner self. And, and it's just it's just garbage. Yeah. And uh, you know it's, it's not a happy thing. Yeah. And it, it it doesn't happen just like that. I mean, you know, it, uh, so so you get saved, you know, but but there's still all this garbage just working in you all the, all the time. And uh, you know, it it's it's just like like uh, hey boom I saw the light and all I'm saved you know and blah blah blah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a, well. It's a yeah. It's a it's a it's a struggle. It is. It is. And well, and but the thing is that as as much as much as learning to grow beyond all that filth that's that's in me or at least in my behavior is the is the joy learning also at the same time about what I already have. Not just where I'm trying to get to, but what I already have. And then I can have joy whether I'm getting whipped or whether I'm dealing with the garbage that I know is inside me. I can say with the Apostle Paul, it's not I, it's Christ living in me. And that me that's full of garbage has been crucified. And praise God for that, because that's what it deserved, and that's what it got. And uh, and praise God for it. 
Yeah. I don't think we even have a concept of how it's going to get saved. I mean, That's probably true. Everybody can use the word hell and everything, but when you get saved and you realize that what God has done for you, hell was never really that vivid. Yeah. Yeah. Until now we know what hell is. Hell is a place where there's nothing. Yeah. You know, you're nothing. But um, I don't think you know what hell is until you get saved. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. He you, 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 comes throughout your life and, and, and doesn't. And we don't even read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and while well, you're right, and the Holy Spirit is there now to teach you more and more about what it is. Yeah, and and unless you're a Roman Catholic, unless you're a Roman Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. On, our, on our third anniversary, we're in purgatory for three days. Were you? <laughs> Where's that at? Purg- Colorado. Purgatory, Colorado. Yeah. Went to purgatory and came back out. Huh? See, the thing is that that learning learning more and more about hell now doesn't make us scared the way we were before we got saved. What it does is it gives us a sense of urgency because there's other people out there that are on that on their way to that horrible place. What are you gonna say, Rachel? I was I was thinking about it like well, we live in a world that our God is love, and like we live in a separated world, and like the complete and utter truth of hell is a complete separation from love. And that would be hate. It would be like when when people think like we talk about, of course, the the lake of fire. But I think he, he's talking about something that that burns so much more than than any sort of actual physical fire. That yeah. burn when you're when you're in hatred, when you're in that that agony of just just letting it consume you, and like what it will actually make you into when you yeah. live in that. That that is something that I feel like it, it's helped me in the way I witness. Because when you talk to someone about life, so, so I mean, what comes next, you know? Like, and they say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, or everyone's going to hell, I'll see all my friends there. Like, you know, all the different jokes you've ever heard. And I'm like, no, like, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I would actually say hell is more probably isolation. Complete and utter darkness, complete and utter solitude. You're, you're, you're not going to see anyone. You're not going to know who's in front of you ten feet away. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to think that there is nothing else but this, and it's it's... I have no clue. That's yeah. and like saying it that way. I think sometimes they're like, "Wow, I've never even considered it that way." I've always heard just like the way the Roman Catholics talk about it. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a cartoon place right. to to a lot of people, and it and it uh, it helps when it becomes real. And today being Resurrection Day, praise God that the Lord Jesus Christ defeated all of that on our on our behalf. And uh, I, we have got to get out of here.